Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. As always, uh, too much of a nice introduction by Ruth. Thank you very much. So today I will be addressing to you uh, with the topic Adapt to Adopt, and I hope uh, I will be convincing you. Key successful change in healthcare. Well, you have heard earlier that uh, we'll all like to be on Twitter and Facebook and whatever, so don't forget uh, our uh, SM19 during the talk, and let's start with a video. So this doctor is Felix Bez. Felix Bez is a physician, one of the 163 physicians who went to take care of Ebola patients in the West African uh, outbreak in 2014. Unfortunately, he got infected, was transferred to Geneva. We were lucky and could save him, and he went back home. What is nice with Felix is that every time he's coming back to Geneva, he's coming to give his blood. Uh, so that we can have antibodies, uh, so that we can treat more Ebola patients. So Ebola is a disease that can kill patients before the vaccine. It used to kill between 70 and 80 percent of the patients, but it can also kill healthcare workers. And this is why infection control practices are so important in facing the disease like Ebola. But Ebola can make the great news, of course. You are on CNN very quickly when you actually take care of a patient with Ebola. But this is not the reality of every day for infection control. The reality of every day is that one. Welcome to the hospitals. Infections are waiting for you at the entrance door of the hospital and unfortunately will complicate your hospital stay. Now, what is the burden of disease? How many patients are we talking about? Well, let me tell you, at least half a million patients every day are getting healthcare-associated infections. Now that we are speaking together, there are patients getting infections. And in my slide, you see in hospitals only. Why is it so? Because the statistics for outside of hospitals is not known. Actually, it's almost to be known. My group is working on it, and it's probably the same number. So it means that probably around 1 million patients every day are getting healthcare-associated infection. Huge burden of disease. Now, if you have two numbers to keep in mind, there are the two numbers. Half a million patients every day in hospital only getting healthcare-associated infections, and 16 million deaths. 16 million deaths every year in the world just because of healthcare associated infections. Think about it. 16 million deaths. It's more than eight malaria and tuberculosis together, which makes only around 9 million deaths. 16 million deaths, it means that this is the number one cause of mortality in the developing countries, and this is the second cause of mortality in developed countries, like in our countries. Now, when I speak about this, I like to show this video, and I, I like to keep it silent. So, this is the reality. This is the daily impact of hospital infections in the USA only, in this country, every day. 
the equivalent of a 747 airliner crashing every day in these countries, which is supposed to be a developed country, right? I'm not talking about your president. I'm talking about your country. Okay? So, sorry. Not on Twitter, not on Twitter. Okay, but do we speak about it? Well, we start to speak about it, but we use not to speak about it. That's why I like to call it a silent pandemic. It's a reality, but nobody speaks about it or used to speak about it. Despite of the fact that you can get those infections in those very modern hospitals, you have Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, my own institution in Geneva, as well as in those remote places like these or like that. What is important is no hospital, no country, no health system in the world can claim to have solved the problem of healthcare associated infection. Now, what's the main problem? The main problem is hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the most important responsible for healthcare associated infection. Now today, here is what I want to discuss with you. I discussed the burden of disease already. I want to discuss the problem, the strategy, the scaling up of our strategy with WHO, the results, speak about a little bit about sustainability, and then what are the lessons learned from the journey in healthcare associated infection prevention. Let's speak about the problem, hand hygiene. What's the issue? Compliance, compliance of healthcare workers with hand hygiene practices used to be on average far less than 40%. Think about it, every time you have to clean your hands 10 times, you do it less than four times. It's still the case in many places around the world. I can tell you by visiting many, many hospitals. Now, why? Why is it so? Why is it so difficult and complicated for healthcare workers to clean their hands? It's a very basic act, right? Well, we published a study in actually uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1999 that explains most of it. On the horizontal axis, you have the number of opportunities a nurse or a doctor, but in this case, this is the graph for nurses, need to clean hands while taking care of patients. And the, on the vertical axis, you have the compliance with the practice. And these are numbers, large numbers and average numbers from nurses working in medicine, in surgery, in obstetric gy gynecology, and in the ICU. Let's concentrate on the ICU now, but as you can see, the more the number of opportunities, the less the compliance. Very easy to understand, right? Now, here it is in the ICU. A nurse would have as many as 22 opportunities per hour of patient care just to clean hands, right? Now, at that time, the guidelines were to use soap and water to wash your hands, okay? So let's assume I need to wash my hands before touching you. You're my patient, right? Okay, I need to wash my hands before I'm coming to you. So I go to the sink. The sink is here, right? I'm turning the water, I'm applying the soap, rinsing my hands, drying my hands, and I'm coming back to you to touch you for my first patient contact, right? We timed it. To do this, depending where you are, will take between one and 1.5 minutes. Now you multiply 1.5 minutes by 22, and you find that a nurse in intensive care would, spe would spend more than half a, her or his time just to clean hands, which is totally impossible. Because nurses have a lot more to do than to wash hands in the ICU as well as in the rest of the hospital, right? And this was the most important reason why, because time constraint was too important, we decided to switch. We decided to replace soap and water hand washing by alcohol-based hand rubbing. I don't use the term alcohol gels. You use alcohol-based hand rubs, and the rubs include the rinses and the gels, as well as the spray, okay, to make it very clear to you. I know you are using gels most of the time here, but that doesn't matter. Alcohol-based hand rubbing is the action. Why so? Because it's much faster, 
in 15 to 20 seconds, you can rub your hands. And when your hands are clean and dry, they are clean, you can touch, right? Because there is no resistance to alcohol, because it's a lot more to better tolerated by your skin, because in some places around the world, it actually saves water, which is important and is becoming more and more important all over the world, right? I don't have time to show you the, the, the research behind that, but this is what we did. So we say, let's consider soap and water hand washing as an action of the past and alcohol-based hand rubbing as the new standard of care. This is what you call system change. In other words, you change the system to make it work, right? Okay. Now, this is the alcohol-based hand rub, one of the first alcohol-based hand rub that we use in Geneva. Okay, here it is. And with very simple instructions when to use this hand rub, these are the ancestors of the five moments, for those who know the five moments, right? Okay, now I take a bottle of hand rub and I give one to each of you, right? Oh, you thought I was good, huh? <laughs> okay, okay, each of you, right? Would it work? Would it change the practice? You got your pocket hand rub in the pocket, right? Would it change your practice? She doesn't know. No, you say no. No. Well, would it make a real difference? Let's take another example to discuss that. What is this? It's a car crashed, right? You are in Iran in April 2015, right? You are next to the highway and you see that. Now let's think about it. Who is driving? Who has a driving license? Please raise your hands. Majority of you, right. Are you good at wearing the seat belts? Who is very good at wearing the seat belt? Yeah, we are in the US, you are very good. Who is bad? I'm bad. <laughs> Let me tell you why. My father, he died last year. My first father's car had no seat belt. Okay? No way to fasten the seat belt. My second father car has no seat belt, had no seat belt. My third father car has a seat belt in the front, no seat belt in the back. I had no seat belt to use, right? I'm doing a little bit better now that I have teach my first four children how to drive. <laughs> but I will come back on this. But my father, I've, with age coming, had new cars with seat belts, seat belts in the front, seat belts in the back, and so on. But still didn't use it. He had arthrosis, it was difficult to get the seat belt. And then a little belly, so it makes it even more difficult. <laughs> never used it, never used it. So my father was not a good role model for me. That's not the only reason. I was probably a better role model for my children, but not perfect. Because when my children would sit to learn how to drive, I would sit and, of course, use the seat belt, right? Now, what did it take us to fasten the seat belt in our car? A, seat belts. You need system change. You need a seat belt in your car. Two, awareness raising campaigns. Three, police controls. And four, police tickets for some of us, including me. So this is what you call a multimodal behavior change strategy. Every psychologist will tell you, if you want to change behavior, you need to use a multimodal strategy, a strategy that is made of several elements. This is what we started in Geneva, the strategy that we developed, called the Geneva model for hand hygiene promotion. I will go and fly over it. There are many publications on the topic. We first use to change education. These are posters before and after you use hand rub, right? E easy to understand. We change education. We use those posters on the walls of the hospital. At the time, there was no poster in the hospital on the walls, right? The idea was that when people were walking in the hospital, they would be facing those posters, right? Here you see, my son, if they don't get me, you will become multi-resistant. He's calling father MRSA to little son MRSA, <laughs> right? Then hand rub is an actual killer of cross transmission. Then dirty staff, the way we call MRSA in our institution, get out of the hospital. 
and so on and so on. These were workplace reminders. Workplace reminders to change your mind about healthcare associated infections. I tell you, speaking of education and publicity, this is an excellent way to get the press in the hospital after two days. Because they say, oh, some, something is happening in the hospital. Yes, what is happening? We try to make people change their behavior, right? Here it is. You don't need any translation with that, right? Here it is. And here is the one the nurses wanted to kill me. Okay? You have to disturb people. You have to make them change. You have to really change the way they are thinking about this boring topic, healthcare associated infection and washing your hands, right? And this is what we did. Progressively, bacteria became very frightened by our action, ultimately going to Sigmund Freud, telling Dr. Freud in this hospital it becomes impossible to cause infections anymore. Well, it looks a little funny, but in fact, this is culture change. This is safety culture that you introduce in your institution, making sure that everyone from top to bottom and also bottom up, we'll come back on this later, understand the importance of changing behavior, in this case, hand hygiene. Now, we monitor hand hygiene the same way I show you the first publication every six months. We introduce this multimodal strategy, and this is part of the strategy. When you get results about compliance, you actually feed back the results to the entire institution, to everybody, okay? And in yellow, you can see that washing hands with soap and water remain very stable over time, and progressively hand rubbing with alcohol-based hand rub in orange on the slide make the, differ make the difference. Now, today in Geneva, we are only using alcohol-based hand rub. 99.9% .9 of the time, somebody has to clean hands. This is with alcohol-based hand rub. Soap and water is not used anymore, or almost not used anymore in our institution. So doing that is monitoring and performance feedback. And this is an absolutely key element of the strategy. When you got any surveillance data, whether it's vascular, peripheral ca vascular, central catheters, whatever, feed back the data to the users is absolutely key. Then, of course, we monitor healthcare associated infection and it dropped. It dropped by 50%, actually, in four years. And the cross transmission of MRSA dropped by 90% in the same time. So, clearly, cross transmission was an important problem in our institution, and we succeeded with the campaign. When you look at the cost effectiveness analysis, we were perfectly cost effective. It was published after eight years. This is probably today one of the most, if not the most, cost-effective strategy in public health. Okay, between 2002, and we published in 2000 in the Lancet, and between 2002 and 2005, there were many hospitals visiting us. And guess what they wanted? What would you, what would you like when, if you come to our hospital? People wanted the posters. I gave the posters, but I said, that's not the story. You need the multimodal strategy. You need to understand what we did, and you need to adapt it to your institution, right? Some institutions did it, as you can see on the slide, and it was quite successful, in particular in the UK, where they had a national campaign that I had to actually conduct. Now, in 2005, the World Health Organization Launching the first Global Patient Safety Challenge asked me whether I would be prepared to do it for the rest of the world. And of course, I said yes. Now, what was the first step? Remember this 747 airliner crash that I showed you earlier? Remember, I told you that awareness raising was key. What did I do in my institution? I spoke to the CEO. I spoke to the chief medical officer, to the chief nursing officer. At WHO, you don't speak to hospitals. You speak to ministries of health. So what we did is, and this is the scaling up with the WHO strategy, we launched the campaign from WHO headquarters here in Geneva, you are, and we were video linked to many ministries of health all around the world, and there were around 40 ministries of health in the room. And what did we ask them? We asked them to sign a pledge. I, 
Ministry of Health of Malaysia recognized the importance of healthcare associated infection awareness raising, agreed to use the tools that are proposed by WHO, and agreed to share data. Sharing of data was sometimes difficult for some country, one of them being China, of course. But progressively, we succeeded. These are events that were public events. We had radio and TV and the Ministry of Health signing and myself signing. It helps. It helps. Not always, but it helps. Now, even in country in war like Afghanistan, in this case, there was not a big event. That was myself, the Ministry of Health, and a photographer. We signed the pledge for this very important initiative. Today, there are 142 countries from around the world who have signed the initiative. There are countries coming on board all the time, and today we are in 198 of the 194 countries from around the world with this campaign. This is the largest campaign ever conducted by WHO. Thank you. You allow me to drink. <laughs> so here is what we did. The model that we developed in Geneva, we actually made it for the world based on guidelines that were translated into action. Now action, the guidelines is easy. That's a multimodal strategy. You know the multimodal strategy now. Five elements, right? System change, absolutely key. Education, training, and performance feedback, reminders in the workplace, and institutional safety climate. Now for this, we develop tools. And you probably are aware about my five moments for hand hygiene which are the five moments where healthcare workers need to clean their hands, developed based on large database that we uh, obtained from all over the world. Of course, those guidelines and those tools needed to be translated, here it is in different languages, but also adapted. In Australia, they prefer blue, so they, they, they use the blue, the blue color, fine with me. In Korea, look that they did. And suddenly, Playmobil in Argentina, and Olaf in Germany, as well as Hello Kitty in Japan. <laughs> We're promoting hand hygiene. So Hello Kitty, if I use it in Geneva, people will say, Peter is drunk, right? <laughs> but in Japan, this is big. Hello Kitty is very big. This is what you call adapt to adopt. This is absolutely key. If you want people to change their strategy, if you want them to adopt a new strategy, let them adapt. This is very key. Right? For those interested, I gave a TED talk on the topic adapt to adopt. And I use many of the, the arguments that I'm giving to you today. Now we have two tools, my five moments for hand hygiene and how to hand rub. So in order, it's when and how, right? Now here is the photo I got from Ross. Thank you very much, Ross. I'm using this photo. You are in Ethiopia. Ross, show you this. This is a great example of our cartoon that has been photocopied, that had been color coded and translated into the local dialect in this local fistula clinic. And you recognize our, po our poster. Here you are last week, sent by one of my friends. You are in Congo, in RDC, where the Ebola outbreak is currently where I was last August. And you see, let's go more closely, the when and the how. And even if you ask this healthcare worker, he will show you how he did it. He's counting in French, of course. Hmm? Even fingertips. Okay. Now we did uh, a lot more serious things, like this video we obtained from the New England Journal of Medicine. Very complicated to publish a video in the New England Journal. You have the reviewers. We are used to reviewers. Then you have the video maker reviewers. It's a pain in the neck. It lasted three years to get it published. That, the, the good news is that this, this is the only video that is kept for free 
by the New England Journal of Medicine. All of the other you need to pay to get the video. For this one, you can access it for free. And then we also got the permission to translate it, which is very new, in many different languages. And for those interested, you go on the WHO website and you find it translated. So very important to adapt to any public you want to adapt to. What are the evidence for success of the strategy worldwide? Uh, at the beginning of the strategy between 2006 and 2008, what we did, we distributed the guidelines all over the world. We said, use them, try them, come back to us and tell us if this is feasible or not. Some places we visited, there were pilot sites. We visited before, during, after, and here are some of the results. So we pilot tested and succeeded in very, very different thing, uh, settings, from modern healthcare settings to settings with very limited resources in a very multicultural environment where we had also to overcome, overcome religious barriers. Well, it's important. Everyone knows that in the Quran, it's written that Muslims cannot drink alcohol, correct? You all know that. Could Muslims apply alcohol on their hands was a question. And it's what more than a question. After two years, we run the campaign in the UK. A Muslim nurse who was living at home with her father, actually for six months, applying alcohol-based hand rub in the hospital, was evicted from home by her father. So for us, it was like an alarm. And there were many other noises that I, I cannot tell you, but I can tell you many stories about it. So we decided we needed to work on it. And so what I did, I visited the clergy in Saudi Arabia every two months in Riyadh for 18 months. And I can tell you, you don't do that for holidays, right? And we revisited the Quran and read everything about the alcohol and finally went to the Muslim League to get a fatwa, a positive fatwa for the use of alcohol by healthcare workers. And here is the healthcare worker using alcohol in Riyadh for those in... Thank you very much. For those interested, it has been published in The Lancet. And here you are uh, again in Riyadh in, uh, in 2015, uh, 15, I guess, yes. And you see that they are using alcohol-based hand. Today, Muslim countries is, are the places where the takeover of the initiative is the most successful. So it tells you a lot about the importance of respecting religious background and accounting for cultural diversity in many fields, but of course in infection control in this case. We also needed to ensure universal system change. What does it mean? In this hospital in Bangladesh, very poor hospital, they don't have anything, right? So they cannot afford alcohol-based hand rub. It's very clear. You need to find a solution. Now, in the spirit of equity and solidarity, here is what happened. Uh, I'll give you another example. We are in Kenya. We are at the very, very beginning of the campaign in 2006. It was technically impossible that the campaign would have reached this hospital, but here is a nurse. She, this is a surgical ward, as you can say. The nurse is now using alcohol-based hand rub, and this alcohol-based hand rub is kept in a wooden box. It's locked. Why? Because they are afraid that everybody will take the hand rub, right? So I'm asking why. I'm asking she, when are, are you using the hand rub, and so on and so on, and how much does it cost to buy the product for the hospital? Now, it cost 2.5 times the cost it would in Boston or in Geneva, which is totally unfair. So that's the reason why we developed uh, an alcohol based formulation named the WHO alcohol based hand rub formulation that we gave to WHO patent free. So we use alcohol and glycerin, and that way it cannot be patented, right? And here is my friend, Lozemi Bengali, pharmacist in Mali, who came to Geneva. We teach him how to do it, went back to Mali, and here he is in Africa in his very modest pharmacy, preparing locally the alcohol-based hand rub solution at very low cost. We'll come back on this example later, because this friend, Lozemi, went to different countries around Africa, teaching people. Here it is in Kenya. Local production started in one hospital, and now is produced for 1,000 hospitals by the Medical Research Institute of the country, which is a nice result. And of course, during the Ebola outbreak in Africa, 
where there was no alcohol in Liberia, in Ghana, in actually uh, Sierra Leone, or um, in, um, in uh, Guinea. So what we did, we had our friend Lozemi Bengali going there, teaching pharmacists how to prepare alcohol-based hand rub. And I'll show you a short video about this. The malades had fear of the hospital. The soignants had fear of the malades. Why the spreading of the Ebola was so fast? Because the weakness, the weakness of the health system. IPC, infection prevention and control, was in existence. The most important was just to make, to make alcohol-based and solution available. Alcohol is actually the best way to kill bacteria. It is the most powerful and most efficient way to actually drop counts of bacteria on hands. And it's extremely useful. And last but not least, it has been selected by WHO to be on the essential medicine list. De, de, de pouvoir mettre ça en place ici en Guinée, je trouve fabuleux de pouvoir uh, transposer ce, uh, ce projet uh, ici. By providing the capacity to the local pharmacies to produce by themselves the alcohol-based and rub solution is something which is very important because it restores the trust and the confidence to the population but also to the health staff. Actually, the money for the project was generated by, by the book that I will talk to you about and by the fact that using those hand rub has been linked to a philanthropic action, as I will discuss it later. But now, let's move to Uganda. You are in the middle of a sugar plant factory, and the, the, the sugar can is harvested all by hands over there. Why? To keep jobs. That's a social business venture that has been developed in the 50s, works very well with 10,000 employees, total population of 45,000 people because the family are living there. It's a huge, it's like a country, if you like, producing uh, sugar, um, manually work, mechanical uh, uh, mechanization is very, very minimal. As you can see, we are visiting the, the, the company. Why? Because with the end product, when you squeeze the sugar can, then you press the sugar can with the juice you make the sugar, but with the leftover, you can do distillation and get alcohol. So the main end product is sugar, of course, but you can produce alcohol by a large amount. And that's what we obtained from this company that is using the right perfect uh, touch for distillation. And we are producing alcohol-based hand rub there. I will show you a short video uh, later on this. There is also a hospital that is free for the entire community that hosts uh, people. And this is a social business venture I would like to uh, show you now. Think about it. Healthcare-associated infections are killing more people than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis together. We are talking 16 million deaths. So it's clear that this problem is gigantic, and the burden of disease is huge here in Africa, and we can help to solve this issue. Hand hygiene is the main key factor for infection prevention reduction. Now the problem of hand hygiene is that you cannot use soap and water hand washing. So the solution here in Africa, like it is all over the world, is alcohol-based hand rub solution. The alcohol-based hand rub solution should be available at the point of every patient care. The availability at the point of care is the prerequisite for the multimodal strategy for changing the behavior of healthcare practitioners during patient care. Here in Africa, it's a lot more complicated. Transport of alcohol is really a problem. So the only solution, and by far the best solution, is to produce alcohol locally. But there is no plans to produce alcohol-based hand rub. 
The main reason for our team to uh, visit Uganda was to visit a sugar factory that is linked to the capacity to develop alcohol-based hand rub formulation. Alcohol should be accessible and it should be affordable. The best expert could produce the top quality standard alcohol-based hand rub that we need. This is to me a dream and that's a reality now in 2018. And in Africa, where access to alcohol is so complicated, this is the solution. Thank you. So this is a project we started uh, 11 years ago, so it takes time and vision to succeed, but uh, with these plants, we can, with the correct support of the ministries of health, there are still way to go, we can probably produce alcohol for the whole East Africa, which is very significant. Since 2014, importantly, uh, WHO has inserted alcohol-based hand rub within the list of the WHO essential medicines. So it means that this is human right to find alcohol-based hand rub at the point of care when you are taking care of patients today in healthcare settings, which is a big plus for us uh, for all situations where you really need it. I want to show you very, very quickly a few results. We will be flying on the results, but in, to, in order to insist on the fact that the campaign should be universal and adaptable, again, the talk for today. If you are interested, we published the results of the first part of the pilot test, actually, that run um, in the Lancet Infectious Disease. Uh, in one short, uh, here are the results. We obtain improvement for all moment with hand hygiene. We obtained it for every healthcare workers in the tested institutions, and we obtained it from the different pilot sites that we tested, from Costa Rica in a referral pediatric hospital, to Italy in 150 healthcare ICUs, uh, to Mali, to Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and so on and so on. What was important is that after we implemented the strategy in one or in several hospitals, it became a national strategy in all all of those countries, and this is very important, no, no time to enter into the details. But again, we let all institutions adapt to their condition, because adapt to adopt is really key, in, at least in healthcare associated infection prevention, but I know it is the case in many other fields. Adapt to adopt is really a very important take home message. What is the evidence for impact? Well, I have no time to review data with you, but I can tell you that there are many papers published in the literature since 2012, actually. There has been uh, more than one paper a month published that actually linked the WHO strategy implementation to a reduction of either infections or, or multi-resistant bacteria cross transmission or a few other outcomes, but mostly effective when you succeed applying the campaign. Now, importantly, such a campaign should be also sustainable. So what did we do for sustainability is the next part. How do you ensure sustainability of such a campaign? Now, what we did is actually we have many countries running national campaigns, so we meet all the countries uh, every two years at WHO, we make them come, and there we discuss and actually proceed further in order to exchange and learn from each other what are the reasons for a good work or what are the reasons for failure, which is extremely important. We also uh, got this 5th of May. So the 5th of May of every year, and you understand, 5th of May, you know, most of us have 10 fingers, it's the day where we celebrate hand hygiene all over the world. It's not that hand hygiene is not important every day. It's just that we need one day, so the World Health Organization gave us this day in order to promote hand hygiene all over the world. Join us if you are interested. We'll come back and give you a few examples of this uh, later. There are many organization websites that support this 5th of May. Uh, you can see the, some, some of the websites here. There are country examples uh, that I can show you here. I can, I can go forever with these slides. And there are single hospitals examples that are also on the WHO website. Together with the companies who are producing alcohol-based hand rub and anything that is education around hand hygiene, we created POPs, the 
private organization for patient safety at WHO. And these are the companies that support the 5th of May uh, the most. In Africa, where actually it's more difficult and more complicated, we started a new campaign that is called Turn Africa Orange, whereby, as you will see on the video, we mobilize children at a very young age. Turn Africa Orange. Turn Africa Orange. This was one of the most exhilarating experiences we've had in the Turn Africa Orange campaign. I never imagined that schools would take it the way they did. And the enthusiasm that was actually oozing out of DDA was very contagious and everybody was so involved with that, including all of us. So in this case, what we want is children speak to their parents and tell them how much it is important to clean hands every, in everyday life, but also, of course, when they come to the hospital. We have 15 years, more than 15 years now. The ensuring sustainability is important, and we have developed many things. The hand hygiene self-assessment framework, which is a tool whereby hospitals can assess themselves how good is the hospital to promote hand hygiene. By using system change, training and education, evaluation and feedback, reminders in the workplace, and institutional safety climates. It's a very simple scoring system. It goes from zero to 500, and according to where you are, it guides you to go to the next step. Your score is linked to tools. We have more than 120 tools to help you to change your behavior and modify your practice. In 2011, we did a survey all over the world. Uh, we had uh, 62 countries, or 69 countries participating, more than 2,000 hospitals. And I can show you the results from the United States, because that's interesting. And this has been published in the American Journal of Infection Control. And here are the results in one slide. You can see that in the US, system change is probably easy to obtain. Median 100, so almost perfect. Now, education is a little less good than evaluation and feedback is a little less good than the worst is institutional safety climate. So it means anywhere in the world you can still make progress by using these scoring systems. Now, hospitals actually are using this scoring system once a year and we report to the World Health Organization or to nobody but themselves so that they can improve over time. We redid this survey in 2015, and you can see that there is an improvement in blue overall, all over the world, and it's true also for all regions from around the world, with Africa being a little behind, but still we say we see magnificent progress all over the world. The next step is how to achieve excellence in hand hygiene, because you need to achieve excellence, and or at least, at least you need some hospitals to achieve excellence, because we, you want those excellent hospitals to actually spread the word and spread the message all around them. So we create the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award that is running now all over the world. We are a little bit late in the U.S., but we are okay uh, in in, uh, in uh, South America, in Central America, and basically. You can score yourself using the hand hygiene self-assessment framework. You can enter and answer to a questionnaire in, a, in another uh, website, and then the best hospitals get visited. Here you are in Indonesia with two experts. You always have two experts visiting your hospitals and reassessing your score. And you can see if you win, you got invited in a major infection control meeting in the region. I show you here a video explanatory of the phenomenon. It is an award to identify the best hospitals and to provide a platform to learn from the best. You have a scoring system whereby you can score yourself how good is the institution to promote hand hygiene. And if your score is good enough, you can apply as a candidate for the Hand Hygiene Excellence Award. At each of our audit visits, we only spend half a day at the institution. We use the WHO uh, self-assessment framework. To be awarded, you need to have at least three, if not five years of sustained improvement of hand hygiene and decrease in infection rates. 
more and more hospitals are joining in the program, promoting hand hygiene as a way of life. So a very simple concept that runs now all over the world. Among our vision and perspective is the patient. The patient should always stay in the middle of all what we do. So we recommend patients to participate in hand hygiene promotion. For those interested, we wrote review about it. You see here uh, a doctor that is reminded to clean hands. Uh, there are even countries where it is becoming a habit. Like here we have the social security system covering for 55 million inhabitants in Mexico, whereby when uh, when uh, as a patient you are waiting to be seen by your doctor or your nurse, you just got teach by voluntary people how to clean your hands. Very powerful, very efficient. We have been helped by this book that has been written by Thierry Crouzet, who is the, the, one of the best writers in France, uh, technical writer. This book has been forwarded by Margaret Chen, WHO Director General, and it has also been translated in different languages, published in 2014 in six languages, according to the principle of the economy of peace, because the writer has given the book, and then writers all over the world are translating the book, and we got some money to publish the book according to this economy of peace principle. Some people have helped us to promote the book. As you can see here, you recognize Bill, who is really a, f a really strong supporter of patient safety, as you may know. Uh, we have uh, some images of uh, uh, Obama uh, advice, Obama receiving advice. advice that your predecessor gave you that worked, that was really useful. Um, probably two useful pieces of, of advice. Uh, uh, the first uh, piece of advice uh, was um, trust yourself uh, and uh, know that Ultimately, regardless of the day-to-day -day news cycles uh, and the noise, uh, that the American people need uh, their president to succeed, uh, regardless of political party, uh, which I thought was very generous of. Uh, the second piece of advice is uh, always use hand sanitizer, because uh, if you don't, you're going to get a lot of, a lot of colds, because you shake a lot of hands. And use you can use. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. That's a big help. <laughs> I'm for nothing into these. Uh, and of course, uh, sorry, no image, but I'm not sure I want some images. Okay. Uh, we have big help by, do you know him? Pelé. It's Pelé. Pelé, who is supporting many hospitals in, in Brazil. I met him. We have, a, we have a, a large program over there. Look at him. The way he's rubbing hands while he's visiting is really impressive. And last but not least, at least for me, Pope Francis, who never would visit any hospitals. I got several images of him. He's a strong believer in the strategy. A movie has been made about clean hands for those interested. It's available uh, nowadays. How to continue and what's next are the questions you should ask to yourself. We are a WHO collaborating center on patient safety, so that's our duty to continue this mission and this campaign. We have this meeting that Russ introduced to you earlier, where this year we had a special vascular tract session in collaboration with Vokova. It was very well appreciated. And this is a meeting every two years where we have more than 100 countries represented and we have, uh, we, we have uh, fellowships and fellows coming from all over the world with actually fellowship grants support that we provide to these uh, people with the help of many foundations. For those interested, we have a book uh, don't take it uh, on your bedside because you will feel asleep very quickly. But it's a book for healthcare professionals, so it summarizes everything about hand hygiene you want to know. Now, what are the lessons learned from this campaign and from this journey is important because, as you know, um, why did it work is the question because many people try to use our strategy. It has been used at WHO already for several strategies and uh, changing behavior does not happen without resistance as you know. So why did it work? You always start with a blackboard, right? So if I think about it, number one is system change. We were lucky enough to introduce a system change. Number two is that we had a multimodal strategy that was evidence-based but also experience-based in our own institution, which helps a lot. 
Then we had an implementation strategy that was completely designed with action tools. And the strategy was not only bottom up, but also top to bottom. Very key. Ministries of Health, as well as healthcare workers, bringing top to bottom, bottom up. We had tools for implementations that we translated in many different languages. We linked to positive outcomes, which is obvious. We saved lives. Actually, the estimates are that this campaign currently is saving between five and eight million lives every year in the world. So we could really continue to be positively influenced by these outcomes. We rewarded success and excellence. I show you these. And we involved patients and relatives. Now, people are asking me, what else? What else did you use? Well, if I play with it, we use simplification, co-creation, creativity, community experience, which is what people like to say. Adaptation, silo busting at the level of the United Nations was very key. Sharing economy principles. And of course, we use social media. Now, we use social media, and people say, should you use social media in infection control? Well, let me show you in 2015, our WHO campaign on the 5th of May, we invited doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, parents and their family to join us in a safe hands approach. We got a global reach that was very impressive with photos coming to us from all over the world, and I encourage you to do it every year with us. It's a stimulating, and even patients say, I deserve clean hands, safe hands. Patients and their family, when they were visiting the patient to the hospital, as well as doing home care, there is Mary pledging for safe hands for grandma and grandpa seeking care at home. In 2016, we joined with surgeon in a safe surgical hands strategy, following the pathway of patients going to surgery. So th from the WHO campaign, we ask surgeons to participate, and as well as operative nurses and people in the operating theaters, and so on and so on. We got people participating from all over the world. In 2015, we fighted antimicrobial resistance. So we said, come on and join us. And we did several things together with the writer of the first book. We even wrote another book. Uh, the other book is about uh, antimicrobial resistance, but I have no time to show you the movie here. Here are the results. The results are the mobilization, and that's only via Twitter in this case. We reached 55 million in 2015. We are now at more than 250 million. So it's important to realize that with this way, you could really reach people far over the world. In 2018, we fought it against uh, sepsis in healthcare, and in 2019, we went for clean care for all its in your hands. And this is going through universal health coverage, which is so important. So, of course, you need different translation into different languages that we can obtain. You mobilize healthcare workers, championing uh, actually uh, their, their action and their activity. You mobilize infection control practitioners, you mobilize health facility leaders, you mobilize ministries of health, you mobilize patients advocacy groups all over the world in multiple languages that we could reach by the help of the POPs, which is the coverage of our language using our strategy, which is pretty impressive. As you can see, we are still uh, some room for improvement, but it's good. Adapt to adopt. We made sure people could adapt the posters. So this is Benedetta Allegrenzi, WHO infection control practitioner. This is myself in my own institution. This is WHO director general, Dr. Tedros. You need to mobilize. You need to get people together. So on the World Health Day, Dr. Tedros and myself from the United Nations place started the first ever uh, uh, hand hygiene uh, moment at uh, Solidarity. It was a large chain of people moving for universal health care. And here is Dr. Teros telling in his message uh, on the 5th of May how much uh, no one can get care without clean hands, is the take-home message of Dr. Tedros. Clean care for all, it's in your hands. 
And as you can see, of course, it was necessary for me to teach him how to clean hands. We are, you are in the studio, the recording studio of WHO here. That's a green screen, as you can understand, and you understand why, of course. So, it's in your hands is a, is a part that we like, and this year, here is what we did to mobilize all around the world. And patience too. All around the world, let's rub our hands and let's be heard. I'm going to stop here for reason of time, so I won't show you the dance, the hand hygiene dance. Uh, you know that this hand hygiene dance have seen, have been, has been seen millions of times uh, on, on, the, on actually uh, YouTube, but the nicest part of the, actually I have a very short version that I can show you at the very end. The nicest part is not that it has been seen a millions of times on Twitter or on YouTube, but this is what I call from rubbing to dancing, but actually that it has been adapted all over the world. People have taken this dance and has, have transformed this dance. So I'm sorry for those of you who have seen this video again. It's at the end of my TED talk too. This is Hong Kong, Papua New Guinea, Canada, 
Spain, India, Sumatra, I head to the sea. Canada again, Spain, Portugal, US, Scotland, Thank you very much.